Do you believe in fairies? Have you ever seen a fairy? What do you think a fairy might look like? Hello everyone, I'm Kathleen Pelly. Welcome to Journey with Story. This month, many people celebrate St. Patrick's Day on March the 17th. As you probably know, St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland because he brought Christianity to the ancient Irish people. But St. Patrick was actually born in Scotland and later he was kidnapped by pirates and kept as a slave on the coast of Ireland. One of the reasons that St. Patrick was able to bring Christianity to the Irish people was that the Irish already believed in other worlds, such as the fairy world. And so it was easy for them to believe in a God and in a heaven that they could not see. So to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, here is a batch of some of our most popular Irish stories for you to enjoy all in one sitting. Let's take an encore journey with these lovely Irish tales. Before we begin, a huge thanks to all of you who have taken the time to give us a review. Listen to this lovely one we recently received from Mila, aged eight, who lives in France. Dear Kathleen Pally, I love listening to your stories at bedtime. I listen to them every night in bed. My favourite stories are Masha and the Bear and Jimmy Scarecrow's Christmas. I listen from France. And here's what her mum, Amy, wrote. Kathleen's storytelling is just superb and we love how she goes into the meaning behind each story she tells and invites the children to think about their own similar experiences. The stories are just the right length and are clear, engaging and very imaginative. My daughter listens every night without fail and she often pulls out some impressive vocabulary that I know she has picked up from Kathleen's stories. Thank you, Kathleen. And thanks to Mila for also sending us three lovely drawings inspired by our stories. You can see them on our March blog post if you go to www.journeywithstory.com after March the 17th and click on the blog button at the top. Let's take a journey with Fair, Brown and Trembling. Long, long ago, on the Isle of Erin, in a castle on a hill, there lived a widower and his three daughters who were called Fair, Brown and Trembling. Fair and Brown always had new dresses when they went to church every Sunday. But Trembling was forced to stay at home. You will stay here and do the cooking, her sisters ordered. Now, the real reason they would not let Trembling out of the house was that she was far more beautiful than either of them, and they were terrified that she would end up being married before they were. One Sunday morning, after the other two had gone to church, the old henwife came into the kitchen to Trembling and said, It's at church you ought to be this day, instead of working here at home. How can I go? said Trembling. I have no clothes good enough to wear at church, and if my sisters were to see me there, they'd never let me out of the house again. Whisht now, child, said the henwife. You are a good and kind girl, and you deserve a finer dress than ever they have seen. Now tell me, dear, what kind of dress would you like? Trembling thought for a moment and then replied, I would love a dress as white as snow, and for my feet, a pair of grass-green shoes. The henwife put on the cloak of darkness, clipped a piece from Trembling's old dress, and began to mutter a strange chant. And the next moment, lo and behold, she was holding out a pearly white gown and a pair of shoes as green as shamrocks. 
trembling, gasped with delight as she dressed herself in the beautiful new clothes. Then the henwife led her outside, where a milk-white mare with a golden saddle stood waiting. Trembling mounted the horse, and just before she set off, the henwife called out to her, "'You must not go inside the door of the church, and the minute the people rise up at the end of Mass, you must ride home as fast as the mare will carry you.' Trembling thanked her, waved goodbye, and set off for the church. All through Mass, Trembling stood at the doorway in the back of the church. Again and again people turned around to stare, wondering who this beautiful young woman could be. As soon as Mass had finished, Trembling hurried off. Some of the young men tried to overtake her, but to no avail, for Trembling outstripped the wind as she galloped home on her trusty milk-white mare. Inside, the henwife had dinner all prepared, and when her sisters came home, Trembling had already changed back into her shabby old dress. "'Have you any news today from the church?' asked the henwife. "'Yes, indeed,' replied the sisters. "'We saw a wonderful grand lady at the church door. "'Sure there was hardly a man at church from the king to the beggar "'who wasn't trying to look at her and know who she was. "'And her dress was unlike anything ever seen before. "'It was so beautiful.' "'The sisters were determined to find a dress just the same.' But though they looked far and wide, there was no such fine cloth to be found in the whole of Ern. The next Sunday, when Fair and Bran went to church, leaving Trembling home to cook dinner, in came the henwife again. Will you go to church today? she asked. I would go, said Trembling, if only I could. What robe will you wear? asked the henwife. Oh, the finest black satin that can be found, and for my feet, a pair of ruby red shoes. And what colour do you want the mare to be? I want her to be so black and so glossy that I can see myself in her coat. Once again, the henwife put on the cloak of darkness, and in an inkling, she held out a rippling black gown and ruby red shoes for trembling to wear. Before Trembling rode away, the henwife ordered her, On no account go inside the door of the church, and remember, as soon as Mass is ended, hurry home before any man can stop you. In church, everyone was as curious as before to know who this woman in black standing at the church door could be. But they had no chance, for the moment the people rose at the end of Mass, Trembling slipped from the church, mounted her mare, and rode off home before a man could stop her. The henwife had dinner ready. Trembling took off her satin robe and dressed in her old clothes before her sisters got home. "'What news have you today?' asked the henwife when the sisters arrived. Oh, we saw the grand strange lady again, and it's little that any man could think of our dresses after looking at the robes of satin that she had on. And all at the church from high to low had their mouths open, gazing at her, and no man was looking at us. Again, Fair and Brown hunted the length of the land to find a black gown, the same as the grand ladies. But of course, such finery was not to be found in all of Erin's Isle. When the third Sunday came, Fear and Brown went to church dressed in black satin. They left Trembling at home to work in the kitchen and told her to be sure and have dinner ready when they came back. After they had gone, the henwife came into the kitchen and said, Well, my dear, are you for church today? I would go if I had a new dress to wear. I'll get you any dress you ask for. What dress would you like? asked the henwife. Trembling replied, a dress red as a rose from the waist down and white as snow from the waist up, a cape of mossy green for my shoulders and a hat on my head with three fine plumes of red, white and green and for my feet a pair of sapphire blue slippers. The henwife put on the cloak of darkness, wished for all these things and when Trembling was dressed, the henwife clipped a few hairs from one of Trembling's locks with her scissors and at once the most beautiful golden hair was flowing down over the girl's shoulders. Then the henwife asked what kind of a mare she would ride. This time Trembling asked for a white mare with blue and gold coloured diamond shaped spots all over her body, on her back 
a saddle of gold, and on her head a golden bridle. By now, news of this beautiful strange lady had spread all over the land. Princes from north, south, east and west crowded into the church, each hoping that it would be himself who could go home with his beautiful lady after Mass. When Mass ended, Trembling had already mounted her mare, ready to race away, when the Prince of Amania, who had stayed outside the church during the service, reached out as she passed by and pulled off her slipper. Trembling rode home faster than ever. By the time her sisters returned, Trembling was hard at work, dressed in her old clothes. Have you any news from the church? the henwife asked. We have indeed, said the sisters. The strange lady came again to the church in grander array than ever before. Such splendid colours to bewitch and bedazzle. Surely she's the most beautiful woman ever seen in Erden. Meanwhile, back at the church, the Prince of Amania made an announcement. He proclaimed that he would marry the lady whose foot fitted the slipper he held in his hands, whoever she might be. But all the other princesses also wanted to marry the beautiful, mysterious lady too. You will have to fight for her before you can call her your own, they said. Well, said the prince, when I find the lady that the shoe will fit, I will fight for her, never fear, before I leave her to any of you. And so the prince of Amania and all the others set out on their search. They travelled north, south, east and west. They visited every place where a woman was to be found. Many hopeful ladies tried on the blue slipper, but though it was neither too large nor too small, somehow it never quite fit any of them. One lady thought it would fit her if she cut a little from her great toe, and another, with too short a foot, put something in the tip of her stocking. But no use. They only spoiled their feet and were still hurting for months afterwards. When Fair and Brown heard that all the princes searching the length and breadth of Erden were looking for the woman that could wear the shoe, they could speak and think of nothing else. One day, when Trembling spoke up and said, Maybe it's my foot that the shoe will fit, they jeered. How foolish you are! But still, when they heard the princes were coming to their house, they locked Trembling in a cupboard. As soon as the Prince of Amenia arrived with his companions, he offered the slipper to each sister in turn. But though they tried and tried, it would not fit either of them. Is there any other young woman in the house? asked the Prince. There is, said Trembling, speaking up in the cupboard. I'm here. Oh, her? We only keep her to put out the ashes, said the sisters. But the Prince and the others refused to leave the house till they let Trembling out. And, of course, when Trembling took the little blue slipper and slipped it on her foot, it fitted perfectly. The Prince of Armenia gazed at Trembling. You are the woman the shoe fits, and you are the woman that I took the shoe from. It was you I saw outside the church. Everyone agreed that this was the mysterious woman. Now it's time to fight for her, said the other princes. They went outside, and the prince from Lochlan stepped forward first, and the struggle began. It was a long and terrible battle. For nine hours they fought, until the prince from Lochlan gave up his claim. The next day, the prince from Spain fought for six hours before yielding his claim. On the third day, a Zulu prince fought for six hours and then finally retired, defeated. On the fourth day, no more princes wanted to fight, and it was decided that Trembling should become the Prince of Amania's bride if she was willing. And she was. So their Prince and Trembling were married amidst great rejoicing. In time, they had 15 children and they lived forever after in great happiness. As for Fair and Brown, they were allowed to stay in the castle's kitchen, cooking and cleaning and looking after all the little ones which kept them too busy for mischief and meddling.
Let's take a journey with the king has horses' ears. Long ago in Ireland, there was a king called Laura Lonshack, who had his hair cut only once a year. But the strange thing was that every single one of the seven barbers who had cut this king's hair was never seen or heard of again, and so it happened that none of the barbers in the land wanted to go near the castle for fear they too would go missing. One day, the king proclaimed that all the barbers in the country were to draw lots, and if the one who got the short straw would dare to refuse to come and cut his hair, then he would be put to death. The short straw was drawn by a poor widow's son named Thagwin. Fearing that she would never again see her son, the mother ran to the castle and beseeched the king to spare him the fate of the previous barbers. You'll get your boy back safe and sound, promised the king. The next day, the frightened barber reported for duty. My good fellow, said the king, you will be at liberty to go wherever you please after cutting my hair, but you must swear by the king's hand that you'll never tell anything that has ears and tongue what you see here today. The king sat down on his throne and took off his hood, revealing two brown horse's ears, quite as long as those of an ass. Pick up your scissors and do your job, ordered the king. The poor lad did as best as he could, taking special care not to nick the king's ears. When the job was finished, the king paid him, saying, Now, my lad, if I ever hear word of this, I'll make you wish that you had never been born. The boy returned to his mother, only to fall into bed deathly ill. She asked him what ailed him, but he gave no answer. Two days later, the doctor came. I have a secret, said poor the queen. If I cannot tell it, I'll die. And if I do tell it, I'll not be allowed to live. When the doctor heard that the secret was not to be told to anyone with a tongue or ears, he said, Go into the woods, make a split in the bark of one of the trees, tell your secret into the cut. The doctor was hardly out of the house when the queen got up and went into the woods, not stopping until he reached the middle, a place where two paths crossed one another. At this spot, he found a healthy tree, cut a gash in its bark and then whispered into it, The king has horses' ears. The poor fellow had hardly whispered those words when he felt as if a mountain had been lifted off his back. Before a year passed, when again it would be time for the king's haircut, a great harp-playing contest was announced between Craftine, the king's harper, and anyone who dared play against him. The other four kings of Ireland were invited as well as all the lords and ladies who chose to travel so far. One week before the appointed day, Craftine found a crack in his harp, so... He went into the forest to look for wood for a new one. Where should bad luck send him but to the very tree that Thagwin had told his secret to? Crafting cut it down and fashioned it into the finest harp you've ever seen. And when he tried it, he himself was enchanted with its beautiful music. The great day came at last, and the big hall in the palace was crammed. The king was on his high throne, with the four other kings before him. On either side were all the great lords and ladies, around the open place in the centre where the harpers were sitting. Craftine began. He first played so mournfully that all who heard him were grief-stricken. Then he played a merry jig. And because there was no room to dance, everyone shouted out for joy. Next came a warlike march, and everyone who had room drew his sword and waved it over his head, each one crying out the war cry of his own chief or king. And 
finally he played a beautiful heavenly tune and they all closed their eyes hoping that the beautiful music would never come to an end. When Crafty finally ceased playing, gold and silver were thrown in showers to him. Then the harpers of Leinster, Munster, Connacht and Ulster tried their hands and sure enough they played very well but not nearly as well as Craftine. When they were finished, the king said to Craftine, Give us one more tune to finish decently and put all that we invited in a good humour for their dinner. I am afraid of my harp, answered Craftine. It wasn't my fingers that struck out the music, but the music that stirred my fingers. There is magic in that harp, and I fear it will play us some trick. Oh, trick be hanged, said the king. Play away. The harper had to obey his king, and he took up his harp, but he had hardly touched the strings when a loud voice came from him, shouting, The king has horse's ears! <gasps> the startled king put his hands to his head, not knowing what he was doing, and in his fumbling, he loosened the bands of his hood, revealing two long, hairy ears. What a roar came from the crowd. <laughs> King Laura was not able to stand it and in a trance he fell down from his throne. In a few minutes he had the hall to himself except for his harper and some of his old servants. They say that when he came to himself he was very sorry for all the poor barbers that he had put out of the way and that he had made sure their wives and mothers had plenty of gold and silver to live on for the rest of their lives. As for Thegwin, from then on he was no more concerned about giving the king a haircut than he would have been about giving one to you or to me. So the king and Thegwin felt a lot better once the king's secret was out. Let's take a journey with Finn McCool. A long time ago, on the wild northern coast of Ireland, there lived a giant by the name of Finn McCool. Sometimes folk would see him sitting by the water's edge with his thumb in his mouth. His thumb, it was said, was the source of Finn's wisdom. Whenever he had a question to ponder, a conundrum to solve, he would simply suck on that thumb, and lo and behold, the answer came to him in a flash. Now, there came a day when Finn fell in love with a giantess named Una, who lived in a rocky isle across the Irish Sea. But poor Finn had a terrible dilemma, because he did not know how to swim. And so how was he to go to his beloved? Well, after Finn pondered his predicament for a while by sucking on his thumb, he got an idea. He rushed out and tore up some trees to build himself a boat. But when he stepped inside, the boat sank under his heavy weight. Again, Finn sucked on his thumb and then... He rushed out to gather columns of rock, six-sided each, flat-topped and weighing ten tons. He stood on the shore and tossed those columns one after another into the sea. And sure enough, all the way from Finn's home on the Antrim coast to Una's Isle lay a path of stones called the Giant's Causeway. Finn went off to woo Una and the next thing you know those two were married and they had a son who grew up and left home to live among the fairies. Una and Finn were sad to see him go 
but everyone near and far could still hear them singing late into the night. That's how happy they were together. Now, there was one person who was not so happy with all that singing. It was another giant by the name of Ben and Donner who lived all alone on the Isle of Staffa. He was hairy and hideous with three eyes, one big and bulging right in the centre of his brow. Day after day, Una and Finn laughed and sang and Ben and Donner scowled and grumbled until one stormy day he sent a message by bird challenging Finn to fight for Una's love. Finn and Una laughed at this challenge, but Finn knew he must accept it. He sent a message back to Ben and Donner, inviting him to visit him on the next fine day. So, one sunny summer's day, Ben and Donner walked across that giant causeway and marched right up to Finn's door. Una answered the knock. Ah, Finn's away, she said, for Finn had gone to take a walk. Come tomorrow, she said. Indeed I will agreed Ben and Donner. That night, when Finn saw the giant's footsteps outside his door, he trembled with fear. Oh, sure he's a huge monster, said Finn to Una. Aye, so he is, she said, but never mind, I know how we'll fix him. We will. And she told Finn exactly what to do. The next day, Una answered the knock at the door. But this time, Finn was home, except he was hiding. He was curled up inside the cradle that had once belonged to their little son. He was bundled up in blankets so that only his eyes were showing. What's this, your baby? Ben and Donner asked when he saw the cradle rocking there. And he leaned over and he looked into the baby's gleaming eyes. I sure he is, Una said, and Finn will be home soon. Sit you down and eat some of my oat cakes. And she gave him a plateful of the cakes she had baked. But into these she slipped some pieces of the metal griddle. Ben and Donner took a big bite, breaking half his teeth on those griddle pieces. And he screeched so loud, the earth itself shook. <gasps> What's in these? He roared. And Una shrugged. Our baby loves them, butter and sugar and eggs and flour, she said. And she fed one of the cakes to Finn lying there in the cradle. But this one was soft and fluffy without a bit of griddle inside it. And Finn swallowed it down whole. That baby must have teeth of iron, Ben and Donner said. And he bent over the cradle, he leaned in and he stuck his finger in the baby's mouth. Crunch! Finn bit down on that finger so hard it came right off. Ben and Donner wailed again. Oh, what kind of baby is he strong enough to bite off a giant's finger? Oh, he's just a wee thing, Una said. Not that strong yet, though his daddy teaches some things. Ben and Donner laughed nervously. <laughs> what kind of things? he asked. Una smiled as she lifted a rock. Oh, to squeeze the juice from the rocks, she said, handing over the rock to Finn. Finn squeezed and sure enough, liquid began to ooze from that rock because, see, Una had played a trick. This rock was but a rock of cheese. Let me try that, Ben and Donner cried and Una handed him another rock. Ben and Donner squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and he was strong, sure he was. But nobody can squeeze liquid out of a real rock, and that's what it was. Ben and Donner looked again at the ooze dripping out of the rock in the cradle, and then he thought, if this baby be strong like this, then what must his father be? And he began to tremble, and then he said, I'll be going now. And he backed out of that house and ran across the causeway. But halfway across, a thought struck him and he stopped. Then, working feverishly with all his great strength, he carried away the middle section of those rocks, one by one, for he'd no wish for a visit from that monstrous fin. And that is why, these days, only the beginning and the end remain of the giant's causeway. One on Staffa Island, home of Ben and Donner, and another on the Antrim coast, just near the place where Finn lived. And that is how people know this tale of Finn McCool.
Let's Take a Journey with The Fairy Folk by Robert Bird. Come cuddle close in Daddy's coat Beside the fire so bright And hear about the fairy folk That wander in the night For when the stars are shining clear And all the world is still They float across the silver moon From hill to cloudy hill Their caps of red Their cloaks of green are hung with silver bells And when they're shaken with the wind Their merry ringing swells And riding on the crimson moth With black spots on her wings They guide them down the purple sky With golden bridal rings They love to visit girls and boys To see how sweet they sleep to stand beside their cosy cots and at their faces peep. For in the whole of Fairyland they have no finer sight than little children sleeping sound with faces rosy bright. On tip-toe crowding round their heads when bright the moonlight beams they whisper little tender words that fill their minds with dreams and when they see a sunny smile with lightest fingertips they lay a hundred kisses sweet upon the ruddy lips and then the little spotted moths spread out their crimson wings and bear away the fairy crowd with shaking bridal rings. Come, Bernies, hide in Daddy's coat beside the fire so bright. Perhaps the little fairy folk will visit you tonight. Did you have a favourite story from one of these? If so, you can let us know at www.journeywithstory.com. We love to hear from our listeners. And if you haven't already done so, please take a moment to rate, review and share this podcast with others. Cheerio then. Join me next time for Journey With Story. Music and post-production was by Colette Jonas.